All right, I want to welcome everybody in for Classroom 2.0 Live today. It's Saturday, November 16th, and we've got a special day for you today. One of our very own, Lori Moffat, she's going to be presenting for today. And Lori is, is currently providing one-on-one -on -one tutoring for middle school and high school math students and science students. She's also teaching high school math classes at Freedom Project Education. She has over 20 years of teaching experience, and most, uh, most of the time, she was uh, a museum educator for the Franklin Institute Science Museum in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and a high school science teacher in the suburban Philadelphia the public school system there. She's also one of our regular weekly co-hosts, as you probably know. A lot of you are regular in here. You get a chance to, to hear her. She's usually doing the intro. So today I'm filling in, so she's the presenter. And we're proud to feature her today. And we'll be sharing many exciting ways that she uses tools such as Adobe Captivate and Scratch and related Adobe presenter files, as well as some student-made Scratch examples she's going to get to share with us today. She's also an experienced Moodle user and will show us how she uses those to create quizzes for algebra and geometry. So let's go ahead then and move forward. And we get to hear from you for a little bit. We have uh, got a live binder for today. You will find that off on the side, you'll find the, the different ways to navigate around in the binder instead of along the top. And Peggy has already posted in the link for you there today. And also, the, there's a recording and basically everything, every kind of resource you could think of, we've got there on our Archives and Resources page. So you'll see a recording of today's show. You'll also have the chat. So if you, all you need is just to go back through the chat, pick up those links, that can be available separate for you. And that makes a really fast way to get a hold of everything that you need. All right, now you get to show us where you're coming in from in the world. So you have whiteboard tools. Go ahead and click on that second tool down. And go ahead and indicate where you're coming in from in the world. So as far as your moderators are concerned, Lori's coming in from Pennsylvania. And Peggy is coming in from Phoenix, Arizona. I'm coming from a teeny tiny little town in southwest Arkansas, 365 people. <laughs> so nobody ever knows of this little tiny town. There we go. It looks like we've got people from all around the world coming in. So this is going to be a good test of my geography there. <laughs> you see a lot of dots coming in from other places. That's right. We can connect no matter where we're located from. All right. Now, this isn't the only thing that you get to do to participate. We also have some polling questions. And we would appreciate it if you would go ahead and give us some information. But before we do that, Peggy wants to share something with you. She's got a terrible cold today, so she's resting her voice up a little bit. But she'll, she wanted to jump in here to go ahead and tell you a little bit about, about this one. Hi, everyone. I apologize for my voice. I have caught, I guess, a fall cold. Um, so I'm going to try to get through this real quickly without coughing and sneezing. But we are really eager to find some people who would like to work together with us to help us find great presenters for our shows. And um, I've asked this in the last couple of sessions, and this will probably be the last time I'll announce it here, but we are eager to have people join us. And my thought is that uh, we already have had like six or seven people who have volunteered and expressed an interest. So if you might be interested in joining us to be on an advisory board, my thinking is that we will meet maybe once a month virtually and we'll just share great presentations we've seen or topics we'd love to see um, presented and we'll use those to develop our shows. So you don't have to make a commitment now. Just let me know if you'd be interested in being a participant in the advisory board 
and then I'll send out a doodle to schedule a time. Hopefully that time will be in the next week or two before Thanksgiving and we'll have our first meeting and then I can share with you other possibilities. Some of you have said you'd be willing to be uh, backup moderators and that would be awesome. There are lots of other skills that we could use um, because there are lots of behind the scenes things that go on with our show. So if any of you have any um, talent or interest in creating images for the show, we would love to have you do that or to help us communicate and seek out uh, presenters, we would love that too. So let me know either by sending me an email or by just writing it right in the comments on the survey at the end of the show and I'll send out a doodle to all of you that are interested to set up our first meeting and thank you so much. Hi, thanks Peggy. Yeah, Peggy does so much work behind the scenes and we, we now there's just the three of us so any help that could, they could jump in would be great. We especially would like to, I think, get another moderator. Today you can really see that Lori's doing the presenting, Peggy had a cold so having a couple extra people would be fantastic. All right, so let's go ahead and go forward. We have got the poll questions, I believe, coming up. Yes, we do. Okay, poll question number one, have you used Scratch? in your classroom. So use the polling tools. You'll find it in that little check box that looks like this. It's just above everybody's name. When if you hover over it and click, you'll see you've got the option of yes, no, and none at the point. At this point, so have you used Scratch in your classroom? Let's see, we've got a hand raise. Oh, I bet you find the hand raise button. Just one more little notch over. So right there where you see the little box with the, the check mark. Let's go ahead and place your vote. And we'll go ahead and get those votes posted. Okay, looks like we have got 46% have not yet had an opportunity to try Scratch in the classroom. And we do have 7% that have, so two out of the 28 have. We have several people that haven't yet voted. Hopefully you'll find those polling tools in a little bit. All right, going over to the next one. Have you used Adobe Captivate to create interactive presentations for your students? So let me go ahead and tell you what, before you vote, let me go ahead and clear these. And there we go. Now go ahead and vote. So have you used Adobe Captivate to create interactive presentations for your students? I've used Captivate. I love it. It's one of my favorite tools. I guess I can put my vote in there too. Yeah. <laughs> there we go. All right. Looks like everyone's had a chance to vote. Oh, let's see. Let me go ahead and notch the window out a little bit and see if I can get it. All right, now I can get it to publish. All right, publish responses. Well, actually, I'm not getting it to publish. Might have to have a, one of the other moderators jump in with me. I can't seem to get it to publish. Thank you, thank you. So it looks like we have got 16 out of 29 or 55 percent have not. Four out of 29 have. Yay! <laughs> Good. I have to find some of those some of those other ones. We have to talk captivate some. All right, and then the next question, have you used Adobe Presenter to flip your classroom? I'm going to go ahead and clear the votes and then you can vote. And I'm having trouble with that tool. Might need help with that one too. Sorry about that. Sometimes on Macs, it doesn't let me get into that bar on occasion. There we go. Let me see if it'll let me go now. Uh, I'm going to try to make it float. Sometimes if I make it float, I can get over to it. All right, publishing the responses to the whiteboard, if I can get it to go. I can't. Uh -huh. So I'm going to have one of our other moderators, if you could publish that to whiteboard for me again. It looks like I probably won't have the tool probably for the rest of the time, so just might just have you fill in there for me. Okay, so 53% have not, and one out of 28 have, so 3% three, three percent. Yes, yes, the joys of technology. All right, poll question number four, have you used Moodle as either a participant or a creator? Okay, and hopefully the other, one of the other, other, other moderators can pop that in just a moment. Mm. 
There we go. And looks like 25% have not, and 46% have. So a pretty good, pretty good percentage have had has had a chance to work with the Moodle before. Okay, and I did jump the gun on introducing Lori. So I'm going to go ahead and just in case we've got some people that came a little bit late, I'm going to go ahead and introduce her again. Many apologies for jumping in early. I saw that slide and said, oh, this is my cue. <laughs> and then ended up, ended up getting a little bit early. So Lori, she's actually someone that has been a good friend of mine for a while. She's been the moderator, so her name is probably pretty familiar to you. She ha has been providing one-on-one -on -one online tutoring for middle school and high school and math students and science students. And right now, she's teaching high school math classes at FPE, that's Freedom Project Education. She has over 20 years of teaching experience, and most of that time, she was museum educator for the Franklin Institute Science Museum. And that's in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And she has also been a high school science teacher in a suburb area of Philadelphia in a public school. She's also one of our regular weekly co-hosts. So very proud to have her as our featured teacher for today. She'll be sharing many exciting ways that she uses Adobe Captivate and Scratch and Adobe Presenter files, as well as some student-made Scratch examples is what she's going to share with us today. She's also an experienced Moodle user, and we'll share how she uses it to create quizzes for algebra and geometry. So, Lori, take it away. Thanks very much, Tammy and Peggy, and welcome all of you. The newbie question that usually the feature teacher gets is this one, what does Web 2.0 mean to you, and why do you use Web 2.0 tools in your classroom? Well. What it means to me is the best way I can think of to teach. Um, if I didn't have Web 2.0 tools, I wouldn't be able to teach online. And I wouldn't be able to help my, my math students learn math, or I wouldn't be able to do the tutoring that I'm able to do right now. Uh, so these tools are extremely important to me. And I'm going to be sharing some of them with you today. So how I got started, um, the Franklin Institute is where I really started teaching, even though I was tutoring off and on before that. Um, and I started at the Franklin Institute as a volunteer. And the, the museum is world famous. Uh, I didn't know it existed until I moved to the Philadelphia area. And I was trying to show in-laws some highlights of Philadelphia. They came for a visit. And I saw the Franklin Institute in a AAA guide. So what, that was one of the places we went to see. And I was the atypical visitor. I wanted to read and try out all of, read all the text and try out all the devices in the museum. So on the way out of the museum, I saw a trifold volunteer brochure. So I picked it up, filled it out, sent it back in, and a month later, I still hadn't heard. I thought, well, gee, they're, they're asking if I have a college degree. And I had a, had a college degree from Penn State at the time in science. I thought, well, gee, if I can't volunteer, then who can? So a month later, my mother comes for a visit. And I take her to the Franklin Institute, and she pushes me to go up to the um, uh, information that can affect. And if, if it wasn't for my mother, I wouldn't have gone up there and practically, practically started volunteering that day. It turns out the coordinator had misplaced my application. She had read it, but she didn't know how to contact me. So I was a one day a week volunteer for about six months. And I thought, well, gee, there's got to be something else I can do. I'm, I'm explaining science, but I'm saying the same things over and over again. Uh, and so I found out that they had school programs. They did programs for school groups. And literally, I started teaching at the youngest age possible to start with. I started teaching preschoolers. We closed off the mechanics exhibit and gave them a mini guided tour of mechanics. So it was all about how things move. And that was the name of the program. 
Uh, and from there, my job changed after many, many years. And I, I ended up teaching from that pre-K age all the way to adults, of course not at the same time, unless you count families. And um, so I, I did a lot of actual teaching, but teaching informal science. And I loved it. So while I was there, I decided I'd get my master's degree in teaching. So as I was still employed at the museum. I got my master's degree in, in education from Drexel. And then after I was basically let go from the museum as a uh, budget cut, uh, I found a, a job teaching high school science. And that was all right, but I wanted to focus on the science teaching and not the discipline. So right now, with my online tutoring business and teaching at FPE, um, I get to teach, but I don't have to worry about the, the discipline part. Um, also, I have certainly <laughs> learned to teach online with the help of Tammy Moore. Um, I was in one of her teacher training sessions for Illuminate. I think it was the last year Illuminate was offering those sessions. And that those two led me to virtual homeschool group. And that summer, I was in virtual the virtual homeschool group room practically every day. And I was full of questions. I had to know how Illuminate worked. That fall, she and I co-developed and co-taught general science. The next year, I, I taught physical science. And then that led me to um, not only collaborate, but certainly Moodle, because we were we were teaching with both of those platforms. Uh, but that eventually led to the Freedom Project Education. And now I'm going to begin my app share. Uh, the best thing to do if what you see on the screen is tiny is to um, click on the Scale to Fit button. Then you can see what's what's on the the screen a little better. Now, Freedom Project Education has only been in existence three years. They are fee-based. You do have to pay for classes. But they're from kindergarten through high school. And since they've been in existence three years, they haven't issued any diplomas yet, but they plan to. Um, they started with Moodle and Collaborate. Um, they used Moodle for their information. And this happens to be what they call OLLI. OLLI is an acronym for something, and I forget what it stands for. But uh, this is the, the system that they use. And even when they had Moodle, which was Moodle 2, they used OLLI. But OLLI, uh, this current OLLI is Edline, which is Blackboard Engage. And when I first saw Blackboard Engage, I realized it was not going to work for me at all. So this, this is one of my classes pages. Uh, I've got four different sections. So each section has its own page. Um, I'm required to put information in this column. The rest pretty much stays. But again, this is fee-based. Uh, but Edline just didn't work. And one reason it didn't work was because of not being able to have images with math questions. Now, this is my own Moodle site. I convinced FPE that um, I needed to have Moodle back. I couldn't work with Edline. Students had to be able to see images like this one along with their math problems. Uh, I couldn't do this in Edline. I would have had to have a separate file that had the images, and they had to go back and forth between question choices for answers as well as the images. And I knew that wasn't going to work. Um, another thing Moodle, or not Moodle, Edline could not do was run something like a SCORM. A SCORM is an acronym for Scalable Object 
reference model, something like that. And this is how um, I review, I, I quiz geometry students with these files with uh, SCORMs. These report grades directly to Moodle. I do not have to grade these. And I created this one with Adobe Captivate. Now, Captivate is not free. I saw that question in chat before I started speaking about the tools. But Captivate is available by subscription. And it's pretty reasonably priced by subscription. Um, matter of fact, pretty much all of Adobe products now are heading towards the prescription or the subscription, not prescription, subscription format. Um, you can you can pay for Captivate for one month and get some materials built. Um, I've got the annual subscription, and when I answer a question and then submit an answer. You can tell that I get immediate feedback for my re my responses, and that's what I wanted. I wanted to be able to give students immediate feedback for their answer choices. Now Moodle will do that to some degree. There are some question types in Moodle that are different, but the SCORMs I still use in my geometry classes. And if I go back to this. Here's one of those multiple choice questions. And I, I have to use HTML code to get the square root symbol. Uh, this answer, Moodle can grade if it's numeric, but any extra, even an extra space in that field will count as wrong. So students then ask me by email, can you please check on such and such test questions so I can go back in and check their answer. Now, not only did I have the SCORM on, on uh, my Moodle, this is actually available to you if you want to try it out. If I go back to the main page in this right-hand column of my website, you'll see five different files to try out. Uh, one of those is that SCORM that I just showed you. This happens to be for that geometry lesson. This is a drag and drop I made with Captivate. It's also a SCORM. And then I've got some practice problems for one of my other classes. And this Captivate file is one that I created not too long ago. I tried to combine some, some techniques in that file. So, but these are all ones that you can actually go and, and try out yourselves. So the SCORM was one. One of these examples is actually Adobe Presenter. Uh, this is a set of directions I made with Presenter that will allow students to uh, make a scratch project. What I discovered last year when I was teaching for FPE was that the book content is not enough to go to the end of the school year. So I had to figure out, what are we going to do for the last six weeks or so of class? So I found Scratch in one of the Classroom 2.0 Live webinars and decided this would make a very good way to, to not only practice logic st skills and organization skills, but also to allow students to be creative. So here, here is Scratch. And when it was developed by folks at MIT, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, it's been around for some time. And they now have two different versions that you can use. The newest is also one that is partly purely browser-based. So you can create a, a Scratch project, a Scratch file, by literally dragging pieces and snapping them together. Um, and I'm just connecting some. So if I, if I click the, the green flag or click here, green flag, 
you can see that that cat's going to point to wherever the mouse pointer is supposed to be. Now, I'm no expert in Scratch. I've got some students that really know what they're doing with Scratch. They've been using Scratch for years. And that's one of the projects I'm going to be sharing with you. Um, the extra credit project that was at the very top of that Try This block in my Moodle uh, is for this semester. What I'm asking students to do with that project is to use Scratch to explain a math concept. And what I found last year was that students did well when they used either a story or a game type format. But they had to explain something from their math book to, to a younger child, an elementary school age child. So let's play one of those. And this is the one that just came in this week. He calls it crazy cancellation. And this is on my Weebly website. And the way you get to that is hover over resources and look at student projects. And that's the very top one. These are all student projects. The next four were all final math projects. Now, this is from an Algebra 1 student. and. It pretty much explains itself once I start it. It is interactive. So let's see what the math bat's going to show us what to do. So my Algebra 1 students are either ninth grade or eighth grade. I'm going to say yes. So MathBat not only does a walkthrough, which I do in class, so he's, he's modeling what I do. Um, he also has another example. After he finishes this first canceling one.
Math back's almost done. Now, once the student created this project, um, he had his eight-year-old sister try it out. And she understood cancellation quite well from the project. That's, that was my goal, to have students be able to explain a math concept but using Scratch. So Scratch can do some pretty sophisticated things. Now, some of my other Captivate projects, I'm not necessarily going to run entirely through. This is an introduction to Scratch that I created using Adobe Presenter. Um, I did this with the 30-day free trial version of Adobe. It was my very first or, of Adobe Presenter. It was my, my very first Adobe Presenter project. I'd never used Adobe Presenter before. And it's also on my Weebly website. It's in the math resources fly, fly out. There are also some other, th other resources here that uh, I may talk about, some of which are free. Uh, Presenter, though, was one of the um, connected educator um, opportunities that, were, that Adobe gave last month. And, and thanks to Tammy, uh, she told me about that particular opportunity. And I was able to get Presenter for uh, almost, well, actually a little bit over an entire year's worth of a subscription for Presenter. So I can make not only this type of file, which I did use with my students. This was how they learned about Scratch before they came into the class time that I did their first Scratch lesson with them. So they had some background before they started. Now, Scratch is full of background information, especially in the, the version 2. Over here, with this question mark, if it flies out, it should. There we go. Not only do you have a step-by-step -step introduction, but also um, there are other getting started tutorials here. And these tell you some um, hints about how to do specific things within Scratch, like animation, um, or how to make games within Scratch, or how to make stories within Scratch. I saw someone type in chat before I began speaking again about not knowing how to use Scratch with English. Well, that's something you can easily do with Scratch. Um, you can have characters talk to each other. Now, I wasn't looking for grammatical or spelling errors it, for my student project, since I'm teaching math right now. But certainly, that could be something you could check, check on. Uh, and then there are also little mini tutorials on just how to do something with certain blocks inside Scratch. So if you click on one of the block types, you get a sequence. And then it shows you what you're doing. So this part of Scratch 2, I, I really think would help students and even, even teachers who aren't familiar with Scratch, because that allows a place to start, or many, many places to start. And also, then students can, can build on their projects from there. And that's, that's the beauty of Scratch. You don't have to just take this sequence of blocks. Uh, the projects that are on the site that have been made public are free to add upon. And Scratch, the Scratch team encourages that, to take an existing project and add to it and then upload it again. Um, when you, even if you use the browser-based version of Scratch, you can actually download the file to your computer. Um, so you can actually save projects. A student, by the way, pointed that out to me, the same student that made that um, MathBat project. Now, I also have a, 
a um, publicly accessible course that I put on eliatomy that I called the basics of scratch. I made this back in May when I was finishing up scratch and I had found eliatomy. Um, this course is now public. You can actually follow the link, go to the course, and try some things out. I pulled together some resources about Scratch, as well as explained something about what Scratch is. Now, when I made this course, it was Scratch 2 was just browser-based. Now there is an offline version. You can actually download the program and you don't have to be connected to the internet to make projects. Um, we did discover last spring that Scratch will allow incorrect code. Um, a project may not work as a student has planned it, so there are some, some debugging steps that sometimes students have to take. So I gathered together some of these introductory videos that, that students can play or you can play. I also pulled in the LearnScratch.org um, curriculum guides, basically. They give different projects in three different guides. And the guides, in some cases, do repeat topics but they use different projects to do that. So for each page within one of these, and I'll open, I, don't, I won't open that just yet. I may come back to this. Uh, the first curriculum guide, the first guide has eight lessons, the second 24, then 32. So depending on the amount of time that you have in the classroom, you can pick the appropriate LearnScratch.org guide. Now, these were all developed, as well as the videos, with Scratch 1.4. I have discovered that 2 has some different blocks than 1.4 does, but it's not too difficult to come up with a way to get around that if you're trying to do something specific. Um, I also attached two documents that I created. I scanned YouTube for um, the basics of Scratch and some game videos. There are many, many more probably now than what I found last, last spring, as well as just math-related videos. Now, the links on these documents are to view pure files, because we were not allowed, to, and still aren't, to, to send students directly to YouTube. So this cleans up some of the extra things. So View Pure is another, another tool that I use. So that's Iliatomy. Um, you can actually try out the, the projects here. Um, certainly watch the videos. You cannot get to the Scratch course that you see on my Moodle. Uh, that's, that's closed. Since FPE um, has um, basically the, the, the students that I have right now are FPE students. Um, I don't feel comfortable um, asking for other students right now, currently, to to enroll in the courses that I have. But again, these are ones that, that anybody can try. These, these files are any ones that any, any people, anyone can try the, the files that are in the try these one, the try these block. Um, some other, oh, that's, that's the front page of my Weebly site. I saw that, we saw that, we saw that, I'm trying to find something that I haven't shown you yet. This is one of the first projects I created with Captivate. Um, this is scored inside Moodle as a SCORM, like that geometry project, the, the geometry multiple choice question. But what happens with this is that students get extra credit 
for uh, getting a score with this. So if I play it forward, what they do is drag the phrases that are here in the right column over to the expressions in the, in the left. So if I drag this one there, it's going to disappear. Some of them repeat, too. So if I actually place them in the right places, I, I have all the points for this particular slide. And there are four others, so I'm not going to go through the other four. You can have a chance to play that. This is one. This was a, the most recent Captivate project that you can see on my website that you can try out yourself. And I wanted to, I'm, I'm actually taking a course that Tammy Moore's giving about Adobe Captivate. And I wanted to pull some things together that we had been learning to do, but in a, in a project that I could use with my math students. So I decided to give some information about the Pythagorean theorem. And you can try out this one. Two of the files that this pulls from, Captivate can actually pull web files, internet files, into a project. So this is one. And I like this. This is at, at um, NLVM, the National Library of Virtual Manipulatives. And it's got a lot of different math manipulatives. This one allows you to rearrange the triangles and squares by rotating them from the corners and then positioning them that will allow you to match up the triangles and the squares, depending on the grouping, to uh, parts of proofs for the Pythagorean theorem. And there are, there's this page of puzzles. There's also two more puzzles. And one of my, and also in that Captivate project is one of my favorite um, YouTube videos.
in Algebra 2, the Pythagorean theorem shows up very early. And I played that inside of the live class, which is, again, Adobe Connect. Um, and early on in the school year, and a parent emailed me saying that, that she loved that video, and the whole family was singing that song the rest of the day. That's a probably late 1960s pop song called the Popcorn Song. So that, that's the background for that. Now, when I'm teaching in Connect, um, I now use PowerPoint files. That's this one on the uh, left hand pod inside of Connect. And uh, I, I'm still bringing in Collaborate slides. I still have to transform Collaborate slides into files that I can run in Connect. I'm still in the process of finishing that up for this school year. Here on the right, you see practice problems for this same pair of lessons. I teach two algebra lessons in one 50-minute class and also two geometry lessons in a 50-minute class. But this gives students immediate feedback. They enter an answer in these blocks and then click in on the Submit button, uh, and they get feedback on whether or not the, the answer they put in is correct. So they get to practice entering answers, and they get um, to ask me questions, because usually we finish the lessons before the end of the 50 minutes. So they're working on these practice problems or starting on their homework before they even leave the class. This is a, a flash file that I made inside um, Adobe Collabor or Adobe Captivate. This is a Captivate file. This is a presenter file. Um, so I'm, I'm using these tools daily. I'm going to go ahead and stop app sharing and go to my the slide that I wanted to show last. Here are um, ways to contact me. Um, the, the Weebly website is the one that I was app sharing. The first website is my online tutoring business website. Um, the Moodle website is there, as well as how to contact me by Facebook and Twitter. Um, actually, I did have interactive slides inside Collaborate. I have to change those for Connect. Yeah, Tammy is a pro at that. Had a couple other questions that came in a little bit earlier. Samples was curious okay. about, do you optimize these for mobile devices? I wasn't sure if that was for the Scratch or for the Captivate. So maybe answer for both, if you know. Um, Captivate can be optimized, optimized for mobile. I do know that when students are live inside of my Connect classes, when we get to those practice problems, they cannot get to them with a mobile device. I have a student that consistently logs in with an iPad, and he can't play them, even if they were ones that uh, I have pre-optimized. I can optimize that. Scratch, the, the browser-based version should be able to, to play on mobile devices. I know they don't yet have apps for mobile. Have I found a good collection of short, simple, open prompts for students to use Scratch? Um, not yet, Wes. I have taken prompts from the LearnScratch.org. I've used their examples so far. Matter of fact, on Tuesday and Monday, I'm going to be doing lessons with Scratch with my students. And on Monday, they are going to be creating animations. And that's from a LearnScratch.org assignment. So on Tuesday, they are going to be actually creating a storyteller project that has um, random sentences that 
that Scratch will pick from and assemble a story. So there's another English related project that's in the learnscratch.org number three. And, and Tammy, you said you had some other questions? Yeah, there, there was uh, uh, Aunt Tommy had asked about how long does it take for the students to create a Scratch project? Actually, not very long at all. Even students that have practically no experience with Scratch, um, they will create their project. Now, we have done some basic activities so far. When I get to more involved activities like um, having them create a story or having them create a game, I'm probably going to give them some more time to actually put the project together. But these first few assignments have been fairly basic. Like the very first one, they were just using motion and sound blocks. That was it. So a lot of them finished that in 10 to 15 minutes in class. They were able to send me a screenshot during class, so they already finished the work. Uh, the one after that, one of the assignments I had seen from the Scratch Ed team was take eight given blocks and come up with a project. They couldn't add anything other than those eight blocks. Now for Scratch 2, it's 10. They changed a couple of them. So that was the second one. So I'm, I'm building on their knowledge of Scratch. Um, the third one was an about me assignment. They were to tell me three things about themselves but using Scratch. For some of them, that took a, a bit longer to try to figure out how to get Scratch to say something. But with Scratch 2, that's pretty easy to find. Because if you have a question like that, you can go through those mini tutorials to figure out how to how to get some uh, the the save blocks. Where are they and how to assemble them? And Scratch does have video tutorials that Peggy's just posted the link for. So Scratch is actually really fun. They Scratch helps them learn that, Aunt Tommy. Um, they anytime you move that character that the default, what they call a sprite. Um, my favorite place I, is my website, Wes. I ask the students permission in advance. I take out their names so that they're anonymous projects. Um, the ones that I have on my website are the one. It's, it is a Weebly. Yes, it's a Weebly website. It's the one that I showed you. That's where the, the crazy cancellation was. Um, they learn geometry because one of the backgrounds is a coordinate plane, so they see those xy coordinates. They can actually learn by doing, and that, that's also something that I liked. One of the projects I made was a coordinate game, and you had, you had to type in the xy coordinates to have the cat go catch a fish, and if you get the cat on the fish, then you win the round. Yes, Weebly is free. And it, it, it's they've actually updated Weebly. Um, it's now easier. It was easy before, but now it's even easier to create your own website. But yeah, the Weebly is, is how I like to showcase student work. You're welcome, Wes. Yes, the blog posts for Classroom 2.0 Live are published on Weebly, yeah. Starting with Scratch, that if I would be helping somebody learn to code, I would send them to the Scratch site and the tutorials to begin with that. Hopscotch works on iPads. Thanks, Wes. Um, on, I know Scratch works on Macs and PCs. Um, Code.org I saw in the chat a while back. That has a lot of different programs. Yes, Wes, you can tell us about Hopscotch. That's one that I don't know anything about.
Thanks, Patty. Scratch even runs on Raspberry Pi, OK? Oh, terrific, Wes. Thanks, Paula. Yeah, Scratch is fun. Um, and I, when I first saw the Scratch website and saw that they were indeed using Scratch with kindergartners, I thought, well, gee, my high school students ought to be able to do this. Thanks, Wes. Yes, Wes, are you taking the mic to tell us about um, hopscotch? OK, hey, sorry. I, I was actually in the wind. I'm on my iPhone. Uh, I, was, I was walking. So, oh, OK. <laughs> um, yes, hopscotch is, a, you, hopscotch is a free app. And it is available for iPad. and. It is very scratch-like. It is block-based, but it is more limited. Mm -hmm. There's not as there are not as many blocks, but it is really a wonderful. I mean, if you've got iPads, you can't. I have not figured out a way to use Scratch for students to create projects, uh, even though there are some browsers mm -hmm. that will let you play Scratch projects. So I just mm -hmm. encourage people to mm -hmm. check it out if you do have iPads, and you can use a lot of the same skills and concepts that you know students may have had in Scratch or that you want them to develop in Scratch inside Hopscotch. Great. Thanks, Wes. Actually, Aunt Tommy, if you go to my site and look at that coordinate game, that should help with the XY coordinates. Yeah, Hopscotch is a great alternative. I know Scratch isn't yet available for um, Androids either. I tried that. But it's certainly available on, on the browser or the standalone programs. They have both versions in their FAQ. You can get links to download the programs. And um, now students need to send me their projects. That's a good question. I don't know if it works on Google Chromebooks. Um, I, like I said, I know it doesn't work on Androids. Um, it doesn't work on iPads. It may not. It does? Oh, good. Good, Wes. Thank you. I didn't know the answer to that one. I didn't. Yeah. Yeah, the Scratch 2 is web-based, so it would work in the Chrome browser. So you could, you could run it from the browser, yes. You know, an experiment for me would be to make a Scratch project in the browser, save it to my Android and my Android tablet, and then see if I can open it from the Android. That would be an interesting experiment. Something I just thought of. Yeah, right. The Android browser does. I I have a, a Google Google Play access, so I have Google Chrome on my browser too. Wes, thanks. But saving it to the Android and opening it from the Android. Yeah, Hopscotch is an app, Aunt Tommy. Yes, it is an app. I just posted the link. It took me a little bit to go find it. I think they're still doing because I remember getting an email saying they were going to extend it. So if you want oh, okay. that year free Adobe Presenter that lets you uh, do screen recordings, which I think you'll love. Um, it's available for a year free. Uh, you get the full version. It's a, a Windows only software. However, they do have a free Mac, uh, free Mac, I'm trying to think of what it's called. Hold on a second. 
it's not the full program, but the screen recorder is free on Mac, and it is called. I'm trying to find it. Let's see. Oh, I'm going to have to post it in a bit. Uh, if I can come up with it, I'll post it. It's a, just the screen recorder, but it's free. OK, considering the time, probably ought to go ahead and bring the show to an official close. If you still have questions once we close the shows, you can go ahead and stick around and ask some questions. We go ahead and pull us forward here a little bit so we can get the end of show announcements in. OK, upcoming shows. We're going to have, on November 23rd, a joint presentation with, with Ed Camp, MJ, it's like it's New Jersey face-to-face uh, -face probably, meets virtual and exciting new adventures to learn all about Ed Camp. On the 30th, no show, it'll be Thanksgiving weekend. Hope you all have a fantastic Thanksgiving, especially in the U.S. where you're having it. Uh, and December 7th, we have Tracy Watanabe, hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, John Costellano, and a panel of third grade teachers from Apache Jun Junction, Arizona, Arizona, building 21st century classrooms with a common core. December 14th, as you see there, December featured teacher to be announced. And then December 21st and 28th, no show, it'll be our winter break. All right, and we want to thank Steve Hargadon, who has, is the founder of Classroom 2.0. He is taking a break now from future education interviews, but he'll be returning soon. So mark your calendars for the fantastic free virtual annual global education conference starting in November, 20, November 18th to the 22nd. So I hope to see you there. Sorry, my slides go forward really slow right now. <laughs> there we go. So the 2013 Global Education Conference. I'll just jump in for a quick second, Tammy. I am so excited about the Global Ed Conference. And if you have never participated in this, it is a wonderful opportunity to connect with educators from around the world. And it starts on Monday and goes through Friday, unless you're in another time zone and it might start Tuesday and go through Saturday, but they have hundreds of presenters, and they're all free. They're all done in Blackboard Collaborate. So just uh, click on that link, go to the schedule, and find your own time zone. And then once you click on the page for your time zone, you'll see exactly when the sessions come up. You can even subscribe to their calendar if you want to get all of their sessions right on your own Google Calendar. And that's a great way to keep track of what's coming up. So I hope you'll join lots of us there. Alrighty, and if you want to, nom to nominate someone, even yourself, as a featured teacher, once you leave the classroom, it will take you to a survey. You can go ahead and put that information in. We do hope that you'll fill, in, fill out that survey. It gives us a lot of really important feedback to help us out. And also, don't forget, too, when we were asking for additional people to come in to help out with Classroom 2.0 Live, that's also on the, the survey as well. All right, thanks everybody for joining on in, and thanks Lori for being our presenter today. I think we got a lot of really useful information.